Hey everybody, welcome to day one of one of my favorite chapters, Personality. I really like this chapter you know, just for some reason. I like starting off the class with personality tests. If you haven't taken them, take the Big Five personality test, take the Myers-Briggs test, and before you listen to this, okay? And I will make sure if this is on YouTube to put them in the links in YouTube. Okay, so I mean, what is personality? When we talk about personality, what do we mean by that? Well, it's basically what is consistent about us. Now, I mean, for the most part, our personality is consistent. For example, let me give you a scenario. Let's say I win the lottery. Okay, so now I've got $300 million. Is that really going to change who I am? Well, maybe a little bit. I mean, I'll get a nicer car and I'll take a better vacation, but I'm still going to be an introvert. Okay, if you look at if you look at the personality traits, especially the big five, which ones are going to change if you win the lottery? Okay. Um, on the Myers-Briggs test, which one of those is going to change if you win the lottery? Or what if something bad happens to you? Let's say somebody you really care about dies well is that going to change your personality you know i mean i i would say no now you may get depressed but that's depression is not your personality though okay so and for the most part our personality traits are consistent as we get older if you ever go to a high school reunion what you'll find is that people will meet you and say oh my god you haven't changed one bit OK, and, you know, we all change a little bit, but our personalities don't change for the most part. OK, and I'll give you some ex exceptions to that later. OK. So there is um, there is a perspective of psychology called the trait approach and, and as far as personality and what they do, basically the word defines itself. They say that if you take personality traits, and um, like, for example, extroversion or openness to new experience, you know, the big five traits, then and you add that all up. And that's basically what makes our personality. And so these people, they like to give you self-report inventories like the big five, for example. OK, so if you want to pause and use your cell phone or just if you Google uh, big five I'll put the link into YouTube and I'll, I'll even anyway. All right. So now in class, we write these five down. I would memorize these five personality traits. Okay. So let's go, let's go ahead and do it. Extroversion. Okay. So if you were to take the big five personality test and you were to score a high score in extroversion, then that means you're an extrovert. You're outgoing. You have lots of friends. You probably have lots of Twitter followers or Instagram followers. But if you score low in extroversion, then you're more reserved. You might be shy. You might prefer to have a few friends rather than lots of friends. You might, if you score low in extroversion, you might have two friends or you might have zero friends. Um, if, and now that's a maybe though, but a low score means you're more introverted and reserved. High score means you're more outgoing. You're easy to talk to, you're talkative. Now moving along to agreeableness. If you were to take the big five personality test and you were to score high in agreeableness, then what that means is this, you're agreeable, you're easy to get along with, you are altruistic. Now I've seen that word on the AP exam before. If you're altruistic, then you give good hugs, you give to charity, okay? You might give somebody a jump if they need it, uh, you know, like in a parking lot or something, okay? Now, if you're if you score low in agreeableness, you're not easy to get along with. You probably complain a lot. It's too cold in here. I don't like the smell of this place. 
I want you to think of Squidward scoring low in agreeableness. Okay, think about Sheldon from Big Bang Theory scoring low in agreeableness. Sheldon is just difficult. Okay, difficult people, they, they're, they just, oh, they're, they could be so annoying sometimes. Okay, they, they, they cause problems just to be a problem. Okay, so high score, you're agreeable, you're easy to get along with, you're altruistic. Low score, you're Squidward, you're Sheldon. And think about how Sheldon was very, if you've ever seen the show Big Bang Theory, I'm not recommending it, but he wanted to stick to his schedule. He would not get away from his schedule. Think of it as like, it's Thursday night, that's Indian food night. Why are we having pizza? You know, it's like, so what, Sheldon? Just go with the flow. But that's not his personality. Okay, moving right along to conscientiousness. Now say that out loud conscientiousness okay that's not consciousness conscientiousness is i saw a time magazine article a few years ago and it said on the cover on the front page this is the most powerful personality trait and it ended up being conscientiousness if you score high in conscientiousness you've got a strong work ethic you pay attention to details you don't take shortcuts You've got a good high moral character. You do what you're supposed to. If you got a job at Wendy's and you have high conscientiousness, you'll probably get promoted to assistant manager in a few weeks. Or you'll definitely get more shifts because you're a good worker. You're on time. You, you don't take shortcuts. You do what you're supposed to do. However, if you score low in conscientiousness, then your work ethic isn't the greatest. You might show up late. You might take shortcuts. Like when you're sweeping the kitchen floor, do you just sweep the dirt under the fridge because nobody's paying attention? When you, when you clean a bathroom, do you clean behind the toilet? You know, you know, do you take shortcuts? You know, think about that. Neuroticism. Now, that's a word I don't hear very often, but I've heard the word neurotic a lot, the adjective form. I want you, when you think of the word neuroticism, I want you to think of negative emotions. So if you score high in neuroticism, you're gonna have negative emotions. Emotional instability, anxiety, moodiness, irritability, sadness, okay? So if you're being obnoxious and you're hanging out with your friends and your friends are like, dude, you're being neurotic. That's what they mean by that. Okay. Um, I understand that it, if it, it sounds a lot like agreeableness. I get that. Like if you score low on agreeableness, I get that. Um, and there is some overlap, I'm sure. But I did read one somewhere that people who score high in neuroticism actually are more likely to be bitten by dogs. Think about that. Now, if you score low in neuroticism, then you're just chill, okay? Um, you don't have a lot of anxiety. You're not moody. You're just, you know, it, it, you're, you're kind of just chill. You don't have the ups and the downs and the moodiness. You're not very dramatic. Um, so, you know, I mean, so, and that's cool. That's totally cool. You probably won't suffer from heart disease in that case. And finally, there's openness. Now I shortened that. It usually is openness to new experience. So if you score high in this, you are willing to try new things. You're imaginative. You're, you're open. You're down for whatever. And I'm not saying that's always a good thing. For example, um, imagine, you know, there in locally, there was, um, there were tourists, there was this guy who come up to these tourists and say, Hey man, you want to take a hit of this pot? And they were like, sure, man. And then they woke up and their phones and their wallets were gone. They got robbed because they were being open to smoking some strangers 
cigarette, you know? So sometimes being open to new experiences is not a good thing. But being open, if you score high, then you're probably say, hey, let's go try Ethiopian food. Let's, um, I always ask my class, I say, is there a food that you would never eat? And some people would say all kinds of things, you know, like like uh, octopus or squid or something like that. In that case, that might mean that they are low in openness to new experience. Let me do, let me do one more description of low in openness. Imagine a white couple from Minnesota who tries their first Mexican food. They go to a Mexican restaurant, and what do they order? Chicken strips in a Mexican restaurant because they don't want to try anything new. All right. So anyway, that's just something to think about. So check out these examples. So would you say that April is low or high in extroversion? She is an introvert, so I would say low in this case. Would you say Sheldon is low in agreeableness or high in agreeableness? Low, he's very difficult. Now here's a GIF of Dallas Cowboys quarterback, Dak Prescott, who threw a cup into the garbage can, but he missed. Now he could have just left it on the ground, but instead he got up, picked it up and threw it in the garbage can. Would you say that's low conscientiousness or high? conscientiousness. That is high conscientiousness. Dak Prescott is a very hard worker. Now, let me tell you something about neuroticism. Just about everybody on television is neurotic. Otherwise, they'd be too boring to be on TV. If you ever watched the show How I Met Your Mother, you know that every one of these characters is neurotic. What is their Thing. You know, Barney is a sex addict. Uh, you know, Robin fears attachment. Ted falls in love too fast. You know, uh, and they're all alcoholics. <laughs> you know, they're all a little bit neurotic. Okay. So definitely high neuroticism. Now, would this fictional character be low in openness to new experience or high in openness to new experience? Definitely high. He's, his fictional character is very much willing to try new and interesting things. All right, so let's take a look at some multiple choice. Now, remember, usually the pause button is your space bar on a video. So if you need more time, hit pause because psychologically, you don't want me to answer this question for you. You want to answer it yourself before I give you the answer. Okay, so let's do it. Juan is generally pleasant, but during big tests, he experiences more intense stress than other students experience. He is irritable and easily frustrated. According to the Big Five model of personality, John would be what? Okay, hit pause, think about it, and then I'll give you the answer. The answer is D. No, B, he's neurotic. He has negative emotions. He has negative emotions emotions. He is neurotic. Now, D looks good, but he's not being difficult. He's just neurotic. He has test anxiety. Okay. Not that easy of a question. Okay. Jose complains a lot. He is difficult to get along with. How would he be described according to the five-factor model? Five-factor means the big five. Okay. Hit pause if you need to. The answer is D. He's difficult. He's like Squidward. Okay, he's low in agreeableness. Homer never eats food that he's never heard of. How would he be described? Okay, hit pause. The answer is E. He's low in openness to new experience. Okay. Kimberly is a dependable person. She is always on time for work and follows all the rules. How would she be described? In this case, Kimberly is high in conscientiousness. A psychologist who classifies an individual's personality according to the person's manifestation of traits such as neuroticism, openness, 
and extroversion. Probably believes in which model of personality. Okay, so that's the big five. So the answer is D. I didn't do a good job of emphasizing that, but that's called the five factor model. Okay. According to the five factor model of personality, which of the following is true? Okay, hit pause if you need more time. The answer is C, basically the five traits of theory. Okay. All right. Now, moving right along to new material, the Barnum effect, the problem with personality inventories like the Big Five and like the Myers-Briggs is, is the Barnum effect. If they give you vague test results in your response, and then you are more likely to accept them as true. That's how astrology works. They say, oh, you're Scorpio, so you have unmatched potential. Well, we all think that we have unmatched potential. Okay, it's, it's ridiculous. And if they give you a bunch of vague things, then you're, you pay attention to what fits you and you ignore the parts that don't fit you. Okay, that's called the Barnum effect. So how do we measure personality? What are some examples of personality tests? Well, um, at the bottom here, we've got personality inventories. So that's the big five, that's the Myers-Briggs, and that's also something called the MMPI. And that is an example of a multiple choice uh, personality test that I don't really know a whole lot about, but when I looked it up, it was very expensive and it stands for Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Okay, and we don't take it because it costs money. Um, but what if I give you a vague picture like these two up here and I say, tell me what you see, tell me a story. That's called a projective test. A projective test is when you get are given something vague and you tell a story about it, you say what you see, and supposedly, supposedly what that does is you are taking something about yourself and projecting it onto the picture. Okay, so what you see in these pictures is supposedly a reflection of something about you. So let me get, so now this is the MMPI that I was telling you about a second ago. I've only seen this on the AP exam one time. All right, now here is a projective test called the thematic apperception test. It is a projective test in which people express their inner feelings through stories they make about ambiguous scenes. So let me give you some examples. This is an example of the TAT test. So go ahead, tell me a story. What do you see here? And then you, so then you give me some story and then if I were giving you this test, I would take notes and interpret what you just said as clues to your unconscious mind. Ridiculous, right? Here's another one. Tell me a story, what's going on here? So you tell me what's going on here, and then I write down what you, I took notes, and I interpret what you said as something about you. Same thing here. What's going on here? Is that shame that she's feeling? Is she crying? Is he dead? Is he napping? Did they just have sex? Is he dead? I don't know. But no matter what I say, I am projecting something about me onto the picture. Remember, these are called thematic apperception test. And then there's the Rorschach inkblot test. And that is Rorschach right there. Good looking guy, right? Well, what he would do is he would take a folded piece of paper, drop some liquid ink in the middle, open it up and get some sort of ink blot, and then ask his subjects, what do you see? And supposedly, whatever you say is a reflection of something about you. So tell me, what you, do you see here? And then if you, whatever you say is some sort of reflection about you. 
But these are inkblot tests. You can pause the video or you can even speed it up if you want. Whatever you say that you see supposedly reflects something about you. So let's try some multiple choice. Tamika is completing a lengthy test in which she must indicate whether various written statements are true or false about herself. So this is like the big five. The answer is A. If you said it's B, that's because you were just thinking about projective tests, but uh, Tamika was not taking a projective test. All right, this is a tough one. All of the following are projective assessment techniques, except for, okay, so all of these are projective because they all are given something vague to people and then the person given the test would take notes, except for E. That is a personality inventory. That is not a projective test. The Rorschach inkblot test and the thematic app perception test are two popular forms of which of the following types of test. All right, hit the space bar, hit pause if you need to, but the answer is projective. Those are projective tests. When a projective technique is used, a person could be asked to do what? All right, hit pause. And the answer is, now think about the TAT test. The answer is C. And supposedly whatever you say that you saw is a reflection of something about your unconscious mind. All right. So basically I have my students write, draw this on their note cards. So hit pause and write it down if you're taking notes. But locus of control. Locus is Latin for place. So what is your place of control? Notice the direction of the arrows. If you have an internal locus of control, you are in charge of your destiny. You make things happen. You determine your future. If you have an external locus of control, then things happen to you. You believe in things like destiny or luck. As a matter of fact, I would add luck to the right side of this. External locus of control, luck, and destiny. So if you were to fail a test in school and you had an internal locus of control, how would you respond to that? You would probably say, you know what, I'm just going to study more next time. If you had an external locus of control and you fail a test, then how would you respond to that? Eh, well, it's dumb luck. It's the teacher's fault. You might blame the teacher. You might blame the fact that you're working or something like that. But you're going to blame the universe. You'd say it's all dumb luck anyway. You're going to blame the universe. Okay. So Montgomery prepares his resume carelessly and arrives late for his job interview. He is rejected by the prospective employer. Montgomery concludes that, quote, it's all a matter of dumb luck anyway. So hit pause if you need to. The answer is E, external locus of control. Okay, definitely hit pause. You want to look at this one. Which of the following is an example of an individual who demonstrates an internal locus of control? All right, hit pause, hit the space bar, and really do this on your own. The answer is D. Now, just so you know, for years, I thought the answer was C because um, I used to drink too much caffeine. And so I figured, you know what? Um, he's taken responsibility, so he's cutting back on his caffeine because that's what I did. But when you blame the caffeine, you're blaming something outside of you. I looked at the key, and the answer is D. Okay. Self efficacy the belief that you can make a difference and change the world. 
Um, it, and I know it sounds like internal locus of control. It, it sounds just like it. I get that. Um, every year I have to answer a survey and they always ask me, if you had a good idea to make the school better, could you go to your principal, your boss, and with the idea, and do you think you could make a change in the school? And I always say yes. That is an industrial organizational psychologist trying to measure my self-efficacy. Can Do I have the confidence? It's kind of like confidence. Do I have the confidence to make a difference in this world? Coco may have been reluctant to try therapy to change her fear because she believes that her efforts to change are ineffective. This would indicate that Coco has low self-efficacy. Okay. Which of the following is true of a child with high self-efficacy regarding her ability to play soccer? Okay, hit pause. I had trouble with this question, but the answer is she's confident. Research on the development of personality traits across the lifespan has revealed that what? Okay, hit pause. The answer is D. Personality traits do tend to be stable, especially through middle adulthood. Now, I will tell you, I read that Openness to new experience does drop as you get older. I had old people who are like, I don't want to try anything new. I just want to go to the same restaurant I've been going to for years. I don't want to try anything new. And another thing, conscientiousness does go up as you get older. Not a whole lot, just a little bit. But during middle adulthood, it's pretty stable. Okay. And that is it. Thank you.